Hi, everybody. Hope everyone's having a fantastic day today. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, before we dive into our presentation, my name is Sarah Frandoni. I'm an ISR, um, and I cover Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana for uh, local government, as well as higher education and K-12 school districts. So just a little bit about Cisco Meraki. So we um, are Cisco's cloud managed portfolio. We cover everything from switching to wireless, to security, um, to SD-WAN, to endpoint management and surveillance. We have integrated hardware, software and cloud services. Um, we were acquired by Cisco in 2012 and we're the leader in cloud managed IT. So we're among Cisco's fastest growing portfolios. We have an out-of-band cloud management. So um, we have a very intuitive, simple browser-based dashboard um, where everything is centrally managed and located. Um, this allows you to scale um, to as many APs or as many switches as you'd like. Um, with the access points, you know, we don't require that re controller. We don't require the physical controller um, because you're using the dashboard as your controller. So this ability to take pieces out of the pie can, can give you the ability to scale to as many access points as you need. Um, and with this, we have unlimited throughput, um, no bottlenecks, and you can add devices and sites in minutes. Um, we're also highly reliable. Um, we have a highly available cloud with multiple data centers. We're 99.99% uptime SLA. And as far as security goes, um, no user traffic passes through the Meraki cloud. We can fully support HIPAA and PCI and also third party security audits that um, are daily testing. And also we cover automatic firmware and security updates. You can find out more information about our reliability and security at uh, meraki.cisco.com slash trust. So why Meraki for library IT teams? Um, first of all, the better connectivity. So being able to support that high density and branch locations with the built-in location analytics and WAN performance monitoring. Um, I actually have a, a library right now and we're, we've been talking about security cameras and, um, and going back to this piece on funding, which is what we're gonna be discussing today, they're actually using the Meraki cameras because um, it can help with tracking people and how many people are in the libraries, which is important for them for getting money from the government to fund their projects. So understanding how many people are in my, in my library at a time. And you can also do this with, with access points, um, just understanding you know, the location, using the location analytics, how many people are in the library and where they're congregating at one time. Um, the improved security and uptime. So protecting visitor data is very important. Um, with our firewalls, we have um, AMP and malware protection um, and securely connecting each of the branch loca locations. And as far as improving public safety goes, um, helping with that with our surveillance cameras. Um, the ease of deployment and management, so being able to pre-configure everything before you even get the hardware in hand. So this is incredibly important, um, especially for those of you that have maybe small IT teams, um, being able to configure everything before you even have your gear shipped out to you can save you a lot of time. Um, and the fact that we have remote management, um, you don't have to necessarily physically be on site to configure a switch anymore. You can remotely do that um, on your phone through your dashboard app. Um, so these, these help with the day-to-day -day maintenance of your network. And then time efficiency. So taking away that those pieces that make managing a network difficult um, and, and giving you time back in your day to, to manage library programs and services and to focus more on your mission as a library as opposed to having to worry about if the network is up and what's going on with the network. So we're trusted by thousands of customers. This is just to give you um, an example of a few Brooklyn uh, public library um, 
City of Fayetteville, Miami-Dade Public Library System, Douglas County Libraries, just to kind of give you um, a name of a couple libraries that we work with. Um, today we're going to talk about the Cape May County Library use case. Um, so Cape May County uh, is located in southern New Jersey. They have about eight branches supporting 83 uh, thousands residents and they have a five person IT team managing the library network. So they needed a new network to increase the visibility and replace older infrastructure that was um, slowing down the network and they they also sought to have a centrally managed solution that enabled their workers to remote to work remotely and to be able to troubleshoot remotely. Uh, they decided to deploy Meraki APs and switches with the uh, help of E-rate funding. So they went out for E-rate. This project was funded through E-rate programs. So why Meraki APs and switches? So the reason why they picked Meraki was for the ease of deployment, um, the improved, improved visibility, the remote troubleshooting, and the ability to make configuration changes and troubleshoot from our mobile app. So how they did, how they funded the project was first, they assessed um, the technology projects that they had in the library that they needed to take care of. So one of their biggest things was, you know, the network infrastructure. They really needed to update their network infrastructure in order to move forward with some of the other projects that they had. Um, they needed to up, uh, the customer wanted to upgrade his wireless network to MR33s and add some additional MS250 switches in there. Um, then what he did was he actually got with one of his E-Rate consultants um, and his director and figured out, you know, how, how would they apply for E-Rate? What were the steps that they had to do to file a 470? Um, and how much money did they have in their bucket to even use? Um, then after they filed the 470, um, they filed their 471 claiming um, which uh, reseller and the manufacturer, which is Meraki, um, that they wanted to go with, and they received the E-rate funds for the networking project. So that's just a little bit of the breakdown of the timeline of, you know, how they applied for E-rate and, um, and how you know all of this came about. So now I'm going to break into um, a dashboard demo here. So um, what you're seeing right here, this is the Meraki San Francisco network. So uh, Aaron uh, over at Cape May County Library, he applied for switching in wireless, um, but we also firewall is also eligible for E-rate as well. Um, so just to give you a background here, you're looking at the Meraki San Francisco network. We've broken out our offices into a bunch of different networks. Um, you're looking at San Francisco's right now. This is what you first see when you log into your dashboard. You see your clients, you see which applications are being run on the network. Um, and if we wanna dive into deeper here, Let's say we want to take a look at what this particular client is doing. We can click into it. And we can see here um, which switch port, um, which switch and which switch port this client is currently connected to, how they're, um, they're synced up with Systems Manager, and then we can also see which applications are being run on the network. So I'm going to dive into the network topology here and show you what that looks like. And then um, we're also going to go into switching and wireless. So the network topology is actually one of my favorite pages to show because it's a really good depiction of how um, when you have a Meraki, multiple products in the Meraki portfolio, how everything works together. So. Um, this is a physical topology that now Aaron has because he has Meraki switching. This only comes with Meraki switching, by the way. Um, that every time he plugs in a Meraki AP or switch or camera, um, he's going to get this automated um, network topology update. 
So you never have to draw out a topology ever again. You can now have it automated so that you know exactly what's plugged into what at all times. Um, it's also great for trouble, quick troubleshooting too because you can log in and look you know, right up at the top and see, oh, I have 327 online devices, two are offline, and a dormant device. So now I can go in and you know, if I need to check out which ones are offline, I can quickly identify those offline. Apparently this is a switch. Um, and this is an AP, offline APs and switches, and figure out what's going on. Um, you can also search this by MAC address as well. So um, going back to the clients here, if we're in this client and we want to see where they lie in the, the topology of the network, we just select topology here. And now it's going to route us based on this client's MAC address where they lie in the network. So. Um, this is our layer two topology. We can also take a look at our layer three. And uh, these diamonds here, these are other devices that aren't Meraki switches. Um, it looks like this is a, a Cisco, I think, router here. So it will identify, but you just cannot go in and, and make those changes um, and dive into those, those uh, devices. So that's the network topology page. Um, Bringing it back over here, this is if we were look to look at that MAC address where they lie. Um, so if we go down, it looks like this is up by a um, one of our switches, core switches. It's connected there and how it connects to the internet here. And if I were to just delete this MAC address, then we're back at our topology page. And we can download and print this page as well. So now we're going to dive into switching. Um, I just went to switch switches. This is a list of all of our switches that we have in Meraki, San Francisco. So up at the top, you're going to see some automatic um, analytics here on what's offline, what's the learning, and what's online, making it very easy for you to identify where there are problems. Um, we can search these switches. We've tagged these switches, so first floor, we can see all the switches, let's say, for first floor. These are all of our first floor switches here because we've created a tag for these switches. Um, we can also download it, and also um, this little lever here, we can edit this page to reflect what's important to us. So maybe we want to edit it for you know, firmware version, which firmware version are these switches on, um, and also alerts, and, hmm, and maybe MAC address. So now we've created those updates, and we have that ready to go here um, at the top. So let's dive into a switch. Um, And while we're diving into that switch, uh, I also want to pull up the switch ports list because that's going to be important to us in a moment. So these are all the switches that are being utilized on this particular switch. It's an MS350 48 full power switch. This is the MAC address here. Um, if we move down, These are all the ports on the switch. Um, as we move down, we can see which um, what's tagged, what tags are associated with this particular switch. So it's a second floor. We've labeled it access and 2.1. Um, we can see if there's any firmwares, firmware updates available for this switch um, and what version it's on right now. And we can also see where it lies in a particular switch stack. Um, so these are all of our ports and VLANs. Um, if we go to power here, we can take a look at the power supplies um, and the power coverage. And then we can also take a look at tools here. Um, so these are the different tools 
that you can use troubleshooting tools for the switch. Um, we can also take a look at the event log, the location of the switch, and where it lies in the topology again. So now that we've taken a deeper dive into the switch itself, we're going to go switch gears to the switch ports here, and we're going to dive into something that's called virtual stacking. So now with the ability of not necessarily having to physically plug into every single switch port on a switch, we can now do something that's called virtual stacking, which is we can configure different switch ports across different switch closets. So let's say we had a bunch of different switches labeled voice here. So these are all of our switches labeled voice. Um, you can see it's quite a bit. Um, it's about 3,000 switches. Um, and now we want to edit these ports. So let's say we want to edit these ports. We're going to select all of them here at the side, select edit, and now we can make our configuration changes. So let's say we want to disable um, or disable those ports, or maybe we want to enable the stacking on those ports, or, um, you know, create a port schedule for all of these ports, or maybe assign VLANs, voice VLANs, um, to these ports. Then all we have to do is select update 200 ports, and we just updated all of those ports um, in a matter of a few clicks. So that's what we call virtual stacking. It's incredibly powerful and easy for someone to make those changes that they need. We also can do something called, um, you can also clone the configuration of one switch to another switch and copy it to one of your other switches. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you configured a switch the way you like it and you wanna um, clone that and apply that to 5,000 other switches, you can do that using the Meraki dashboard. Um, so now we're going to go into the wireless, switching gears over to wireless here. Um, these are all of our wireless access points. So I just went to wireless APs, and you can see we have 193 access points. Same kind of deal as how the switches were. Um, again, this this is consistent across the board, across all of our products products here, um, we try to make the layout as easy and as simple as possible. So um, once you learn, you know, one of the products, you can do it the same thing on all of them um, because it's the same exact view. So for example, for the APUs, same kind of deal with the switching. We can tell immediately when we log into this page what's offline and what's online and what's alerting and things like that. So again, we have our tags here for the APs. We can come over here and edit what we want to edit for this view. Um, so now we're just going to dive into one of the APs here so we can show you um, what we've configured for this access point. And then lastly, we're going to go into SSIDs and firewall and traffic shaping on the access point. So this is one of the access points that um, is located in the building. We're looking at an MR42 here. These are the different SSIDs that are associated or that's broadcast, this AP is broadcasting at the moment. Um, we can see the MAC address, the model of this AP. Um, as we continue going down here, we can see which switch and which port this AP is connected to, and we can easily click into that switch and port. Um, we can see if there's any kind of firmware that we need to update on this access point. Um, as far as wireless troubleshooting goes, so this is something that was recently rolled out about last this time or a little later than last this time last year in January of this past year. Um, but this gives you details on what happened during these certain events. So you just click on these little dots here and it will tell you the details of what happened there looks like there was an auto RF channel change, and then we can dive in to, to research and figure out more information. We can also see the active clients during that time, um, the total utilization, up, 
upload usage, download usage, and if there were any meshing neighbors. At this point, um, this particular AP didn't have any meshing neighbors, but if there were, they would be showing up, the APs would show up here at the bottom. Um, we can also take a look at tools, same kind of structure as how the switch was with the tools. Um, you can ping the device, run a throughput test, um, and then we can take a look at the location of where this AP is located in the building. Um, then we're going to dive into, so now that we've taken a look at what an, an individual AP looks like, we're going to take a look at how you would configure an SSID. Um, so this is, if you go to wireless SSIDs, I'm in configure section. Um, so this is where I would configure my SSIDs. I can configure up to 15 different SSIDs, and if I show all of them, this is what it's going to look like here. Um, so it's really as simple as when you're ready to start configuring SSID, you just click enable. And then now I've enabled this SSID and I'm going to go ahead and dive in and edit the settings on this SSID. If I click edit settings. So now um, I'm in access control. So if I go to wireless, and again it's under configure access control here, um, you can see I, Meraki slash guest 2.4, I enabled that SSID and um, that's the one that we're configuring. If at, at all, at any time, I want to jump over and start editing a different SSID, I just click this drop down and pick the other SSID I want to edit. Um, so that's how, you know, where we would pick that. Um, so I'm going to go back to Meraki guest. So We've selected the pre-shared key, so they must enter this specific key um, in order to access the wireless. We decided not to have a splash page. Um, you can configure uh, a click-through splash page um, or do some kind of like billing or um, let's say sign on with Radius server or Facebook Wi-Fi or third-party credential or Active Directory. Um, and then from here, this is where, you know, if you needed to, to configure accessing and traffic, if it's going to be a NAT mode or bridge mode, um, and then content filtering and VLAN tagging, um, we can actually, for the access points, traffic shape and do some, some content filtering on the access point. So if we go to firewall and traffic shaping, um, then we just select it, select the SSID we want to do the firewall and traffic shaping on. Um, so let's say we're back into Meraki Guest 2.4. And this is where we would apply a layer 7 or a layer 3 firewall rule. And then if we want to block certain applications on this SSID, this is where we would do it. We would do it in, under layer 7 firewall rule. So let's say we want to block peer to peer. Um, and we want to block all of it, um, that's where we would do that, and it would be specific to this SSID. Um, you can also shape the traffic on this SSID. So let's say we want to give, um, you know, VoIP more priority than gaming or VoIP priority over Netflix. This is where we would configure that. So we would just say, you know, um, going down here, VoIP and video conferencing, and we're going to just say all of it, and we are not going to give it a limit, um, and that's going to be the first rule, and then we would just add a new shaping rule. So that's where we would shape and, and limit the bandwidth on certain applications. Um, I'm going to go ahead now and transition back over to the presentation. So I can pass the ball over to Beverly here. Um, and we're going to open up the floor to questions at the end of the presentation. So, but also feel free if you have any questions right now, go ahead and drop it in the chat box um, and we can answer it as we're going along the presentation here. Um, so shifting back years into the presentation, um, now I'm going to transition it over to Beverly. 
um, who's the president of Ed Technology Funds, which is a consulting firm. Um, and, and yeah, Beverly? Thank you, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, again, my name is Beverly Sutherland. I'm here to talk about uh, the E-rate program and uh, ho hopefully provide you with some information that will be helpful in um, shaping your funding year 2019 application process. Um, if <clears throat> most of you are familiar with the E-rate program, you know that it was founded and established in 1996 by the FCC. Um, it was modernized again in 2014, where in 2015, they increased the annual budget funding amount to $3.9 billion. They streamlined the application process. Um, unfortunately, voice services were phased out. However, the um, ability for all organizations to apply for funding for equipment was enabled. <clears throat> Historically, Libraries have had a very, very low participation in the E-rate program, and we're uh, definitely hopeful that uh, with the equipment funding budgets that more libraries will take advantage of this funding. As, as I said, uh, with the modernization order, uh, USAC implemented Category 2 funding that allows for most organizations to have uh, to get funding for network equipment. This was implemented using a five year trial period where budgets were established based on library square footage. Depending on where your library is located, you either get $2.30 a square foot or $5 a square foot. These, uh, this equipment is, uh, the, the funding for this equipment uh, can, can cover just about everything you need for basic uh, Wi-Fi and LAN connections within a building. I won't go through all the points on this slide, however, I want to point out that um, many organizations are not aware that labor, uh, funding for licensing, funding for support contracts, are all eligible under the E-rate Category 2 funding. Um, again, the maximum amount of funding that's available for these services and all of the Category 2 services is based on the uh, budget that is established per site uh, based on the square footage at that library. I also want to note that the trial period for the five-year budget ends in funding year 2019, so I want to encourage all of you to take a look at whatever needs you may have and consider uh, using your E-rate budget to help and assist with uh, getting those projects implemented. Uh, some of the common ob obstacles that we've uh, seen libraries experience in interfacing with the E-rate program is uh, you know, budgeting for their portion of the uh, cost of the services. Um, many libraries may have funding available through the state or through their general budget. However, uh, identifying those funding, that funding and, and making sure that, that those funds are accessible is uh, certainly an obstacle. Um, also, many libraries share resources with IT resources with the city or the county agency or that they reside in, and sometimes uh, getting a pri priority on those resources is a challenge for some libraries, and it particularly is uh, challenging for libraries as they are trying to determine what their technology needs are and making sure that it is in in, in uh, concert with the city or library's network infrastructure. Um, also, many libraries, we've experienced that some libraries have difficulty getting uh, 
participation from local vendors in their, their, their 470 postings. Um, th this can be minimized or, or, or actually eliminated by starting your, your process early and also posting your 470 your, or, or, or notifying local vendors of your 470 posting and perhaps even posting your RFP on your website or um, a notification in the local paper. Uh, many of these obstacles can be overcome very easily by starting early and really uh, in the planning phases of the, the process. The most uh, significant challenge that we've experienced with libraries is SIPA compliance. Uh, some libraries are filtered, but they may not have uh, gone through all the steps to become SIPA compliant. Some libraries may have uh, 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 local limitations to what they can filter, if they can filter. And so next we're going to talk about SIPA. For those uh, who are not familiar, SIPA is uh, the Children's Internet, Internet Protection Act, and it is required for compliance with this act is required for funding, to receive funding on all Category 2 services and even some Category 1 services. I want to note that for the first year of eligibility for these services, you can actually declare that your library is taking steps to become compliant. So you don't have to be compliant fully the first year, you just have to have uh, to, to be able to demonstrate that you are taking steps to become compliant. What, is com what does it take to be compliant? You have to have uh, internet safety policy that addresses uh, access to by minors to inappropriate materials. Um, you have to have some type of technology protection measure in place, such as uh, content filtering. Um, it could be cloud-based or it could be uh, hardware-based. Um, you also have to have a public notice and a hearing to review your internet safety policies and your, your filtering policies. Again, I want to reiterate that SIPA compliance is required for all Category 2 funding requests. Uh, just a couple points on uh, becoming SIPA compliant. Some, some libraries are, are now considering going from not filtering to filtering, or perhaps they already filter, but they have not taken the steps to become SIPA compliant. And what we advise is to uh, revise or, or draft your internet safety policies if you don't already have one. Um, Determine um, how you plan to filter the content. That could be a cloud-based solution like the uh, Cisco umbrella uh, suite of, of products, or it could be hardware based on your firewall. Um, schedule a public ho a hearing and a meeting to actually review those policies and how you plan to filter, how you plan to protect the network uh, in a public setting. Um, lastly, uh, it's, it's uh, very important to work out with your IT staff how you're going to unblock the filters for bona fide uh, adult, for adults who have uh, approved usage, such as for research purposes or for some other uh, reason that you deem acceptable to your policies. Um, and that would be something that would have to be uh, communicated to all branches and the logistics of who does it and how it gets done. Um, it's actually pretty um, straightforward now. In the beginning when SIPA first came out, the technology isn't as, wasn't as easy to use as it is now. So it's uh, just a matter of just coordinating the logistics so that you have a consistent way that you interface with the public with regards to unblocking uh, filtered sites. Again, the first year you do not need to be fully compliant if you have not established compliance or you have not applied for Category 2 funding before. 
you would uh, just need to demonstrate that you are taking the steps to become compliant. So now I'm going to shift to some tips for success. Um, I, I'll keep harping on start as early as possible. Um, the uh, uh, more vendors participate when you start early, you get better quality responses. Um, you have time to really align with your board meeting calendars and to um, access your IT resources, especially if they're not um, a part of the library staff. Um, identify who's going to be involved in the e-rate process. You know, is it I, uh, a, a librarian, library director? Um, typically, we see IT staff from the library as well as IT staff from the city or the county. Um, the procurement officer may be involved as well. So identify who is going to be on your team for managing your whole process throughout the life cycle of your E-rate funding. Um, the next thing you want to do is, is take, take note of any organizational changes. Did you add new sites? Did you um, change or move any of the sites? Did you uh, add more square footage to an existing site? Uh, that is typically what we see is that many libraries add square footage and because the budgets are based on square footage, you want to make sure you, you memorialize that so that you can increase your budget and get more funding to support, you know, extending connectivity to that section of the library. Um, also, any staff changes that you may have, um, whether uh, the, the, it's the staff that is listed on your E-rate, online E-rate account, Epic account, or if this is the person that interfaces to vendors, uh, please uh, make sure that that information is, is, is uh, up to date. Um, and then, you know, as mentioned in the Meraki uh, presentation, part of the presentation, um, assessing the te technology infrastructure needs. You know, how do you want your network topology to um, be designed and to be maintained and to be accessible? What devices are you going to have on it? Um, you know, all these things need to be, you know, planned. Um, also, a lot of libraries have very old infrastructures. Uh, they may not know what is, is, is at each location, so really taking time out to document what you have today is, is critical to really understanding how to get the most bang for your bucks. Um, each site, uh, you know, you want to know what's needed, you know, whether it's cabling, whether it's uh, updating, um, updating the access points, whether it's uh, adding more UPSs, Maybe you need a new firewall. Maybe your MDF rack needs to be changed. All those things are eligible with E-rate and can, you know, it's real dollars. It's just uh, definitely a matter of planning and identifying those needs. Um, we've actually had uh, libraries where uh, after the 471 was filed, the IT person came back and said, oh, we, uh, we need to get $50,000 more for uh, cabling. And, you know, I'm like, oh, my God, that cabling could have been included in your E-rate application. So please take the time out to identify your needs. Um, develop a, a very clear and concise RFP. The quality of your RFP is going to determine the quality of your responses and the amount of time you spend in evaluating the, the bids. Um, in the bid evaluation, uh, price has to be the number one factor. So I advise uh, all E-rate entities to determine how do they want to uh, decide on which vendor they're, they're going to select and tend to do that up front. Um, also, it doesn't hurt to, even if you are SIPA compliant, kick the tires two, three times to make sure that you have everything in place with regards to SIPA. And uh, Beverly, I also just want to add in here to the start as early as possible message. I mean, that is critical because a lot of the times people wait until the last second to do it. And 
as somebody on the other side that is responding, it takes a while. You know, we have to figure out, you know, what's the best, going to be the right, you know, gear for your needs. And, um, and if you only give us 28 days from the time you post to 470 to the time when, um, you know, the 471 is due, that can be difficult to vendors that are responding just because there's just so much out there, especially when, um, you know, time, it's kind of crunch time and everyone's trying to get their get their bids in. So starting as early as possible is critical because um, it just gives us more time to respond. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And also one note to um, to remember is that the EPIC system slows down, uh, you know, and, and sometimes even crashes uh, at when when at the end of the funding window. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you definitely want to start early for many many reasons. Yeah, and too, if you post your end up posting your 471 and something's wrong, like let's say a SKU is incorrect on the 471, then we have time. You have time to basically repost a second 471 and correct that. Whereas if you wait till the last second, then you don't have time, and then that's a whole nother ball, you know, can of worms there of having to do the service substitution, and that takes a long time. And so, um, getting it, if this is your first time doing e rate, allowing yourself enough time where if you accidentally make a mistake on something, you can correct it um, before the deadlines happen is critical. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and continuing with uh, some tips here, uh, calculate your Category 2 budget. You want to know what's available at each site. And you may even want to put that in your RFP so that vendors know to uh, only provide the pricing or the quote up to or to clearly identify the amount of the cost of your request that is eligible for E-rate funding. Um, in calculating your Category 2 budget, it's best practice to uh, reference the IMLS database. That database includes your locale code along with the square footage at each of your sites. If there's a new site, it may not be is, uh, listed in the IMLS, so you may want to get that from your library uh, administrator. Um, but note that what's in EPIC and what's in USAC may not align with what is in IMLS. Typically, that IMLS data gets loaded by the E-rate entity, the library, or their consultant into the USAC database so if it's not loaded in there by you, then it's just kind of a, a USAC just loads up the default data in IMLS. I, as many of you know, the IMLS database is maybe about two years uh, behind reality. <laughs> so right now, what's uh, the data that's in IMLS is from as of 2016. So 2018 data, if you've added a new site or if you've done renovations or if you changed addresses, none of that would be reflective in uh, what's loaded by default uh, in, in the USAC database. Um, some of you may have uh, funds that never got used. Maybe a project got canceled for whatever reason um, and it's completely allowable for you to uh, cancel that funding and then have that funding available for future use. And that's done using a Form 500. Um, again, we will, you know, say it again, start early, establish your timeline, allow time for your competitive bidding, 28-day competitive bidding window. Um, if you're going to do vendor walkthroughs, that has to be done within that 28 days. You want to make sure that vendors have enough time to walk through your sites and uh, have the time to generate a proposal. Um, 
get your, you want to have time for board approvals. Many of, many libraries, their boards only meet once a month. Some of them meet twice a month. So you want to make sure that you account for that timeline, that in your timeline as well. Um, also, the item 21 attachments. Uh, it'd be great if you can review those prior to you submitting the Form 471 because a lot of times that's a source of errors that have to be corrected uh, during the review process or uh, through substitutions, which could delay the funding being available for your project. Uh, and lastly, you know, plan out when you're going to submit your Form 471. Make sure that you have everything that you need in terms of your contracts, your uh, uh, pricing, your, your signed contracts, your uh, making sure all your documentation is in order, making sure that uh, everything is ready for submission, including the Item 21 attachment. And, you know, as a, as a, as a, a habit, just establish a system for documentation retention. Um, now the, the policy is uh, that documents have to be retained for 10 years. Um, and so knowing where those documents are, you know, as organizations change is, is very critical to compliance. Um, and lastly, you know, identify where the money is coming from to pay for your portion, uh, whether it's a grant, whether it's um, from the general budget and memorialize where that funding is coming from because it will be asked either during the review process, maybe not the review process, but if you get into a selective review or an audit, you know, you may have to show proof of where your, your portion of the payment has, has come from. Um, just a quick timeline here for 2019. Um, the window has not been uh, set yet. It typically opens in January. Uh, we're expecting it to open January of 2019 um, and close in March 2019. Um, with that said, right now what you can be doing is filing your 470s and starting your competitive bids. To do that, you want to develop your RFPs, review your resources, um, meet internally to get your strategy down. And um, that can be done between now and February. February is typically the last date, the last month that you can file the Form 470. So there's some overlap with the opening of the 471 window and the 470. So you want to right now start planning what, you, what, what you're gonna ask for. Um, uh, some organizations are already evaluating proposals because they filed their 470 or planning the, or the window is closing very soon. And so evaluate your vendors between now and March. Um, go ahead and get all the approvals and contracts and um, answer vendor questions that come up. And, and some of you will be ready in January as soon as the window opens, the 471 window. You may even be able to submit your 471 on the first day. Um, so all the way through March, you can submit your Form 471. And uh, in July, you can start implementation of that. Typically, the funding commitments uh, come in on a priority, on a, on a we, we don't know the, the magic they use. Uh, sometimes they have different criteria for how they review and, and, and fund uh, the applications, but we've seen uh, funding uh, awards as early as May, um, and projects can start as early as July 1st. Um, if you really need to start your projects prior to July 1st, you can start as early as April 1st, um, however, to start early, you would have to pay out of pocket and then get reimbursed once the uh, July 1st happens, or once your funding is awarded. Um, so again, the message is start early. Um, it's real money. Um, it, there is a process in place and it is a lot of uh, you know steps to the process, but I believe a lot of these steps actually protect 
not only the FCC and USAC, but it protects you in, in having, um, getting the most bang for your buck. Yeah, thank you so much, Beverly. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to go over that. Um, another thing too that I, I typically tell my customers that are looking at doing E-rate just as like a recommendation is, you know, get approved for the full amount for your project. Um, that way you have the option to go ahead and start early if you want to um, in April once you submit that bear form. Um, and it also just assures that you do have some kind of something backing it up in case, you know, you weren't funded in the long run, um, but at least you have the full amount ready to go in case you wanted to start early. Um, so that's just the best practice that I, I communicate to my customers and um, as something to note there too. Um, so Beverly, thank you so much again for your time and for explaining the process. Um, just to quickly go over as far as Meraki Solutions one more time, we have access points, security appliances, switches. Uh, these are the three uh, pieces of hardware that are eligible for E-rate. To note with the security appliances, the uh, we have two different licensing. We have an enterprise and advanced security license. Um, the advanced security license is only 50% eligible. So E-rate will only pay up to 50% of the um, or USAC will for the advanced security licenses for the security appliances. But for the APs, the firewall hardware and the switches, they will cover 100% of that. Um, the other pieces that we have that aren't E-rate eligible, but I encourage you to take a look at and to think about if, um, you know, if you want to go down the Meraki path um, is, you know, other pieces of your network. So the end management, with our systems manager, as well as uh, Meraki Insights to optimize user experience, and then also Meraki surveillance cameras um, for physical security. So um, again, this goes covers E-rate eligibility. So the hardware and licensing is 100% E-rate eligible. If that little star here saying, you know, MX advanced security license is only 50% E-rate eligible. And then as far as the next steps go, um, as Beverly mentioned, you know, as you're evaluating, you know, what to do for your projects, um, check out our blog, take, take a look at um, some of our gear, see what you think. Uh, we also offer a trial program, test out the gear, see how you like it. Um, we also have an E-rate webinar, an E-rate webinar series. Um, so please go to meraki.cisco.com slash e-rate and we have some resources there as well. And then also in addition, Cisco's hosting a webinar with LA County Library on November 15th on e-rate specifically. So um, we're providing the link um, to that webinar as well in the chat window that on this webinar. And then thank you so much. Now um, what I'd like to do is I know we don't have too much time, but open up the floor for a couple of questions. Um, you can direct them either at me or Beverly. Um, thank you. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions and um, all the questions we did have were answered throughout the webinar. Thank you so much uh, for all of your time. And again, if you always have any other questions, feel free to re reach out to your Meraki uh, account manager. Thank you so much.